Morning, everyone. Uh, very excited to be in this uh, in this round. Uh, it seems to be a very exciting session. So my part will be to start with immunity that comes uh, first, very early on. This this is innate immunity, and uh, so I'll be talking about innate immune sensing of SARS-CoV-2 and how this principal mechanism can be used then um, to protect against SARS-CoV-2 and uh, in a broader sense also against other viruses and uh, how innate immune sensing affects uh, the design development of messenger RNA vaccines and also the efficacy. So three, three parts, but uh, I'll start with uh, like first uh, the note that viruses uh, are detected by the innate immune system. And much of this detection uh, goes on the ground of uh, detecting nucleic acid. And uh, if a virus becomes a pathogen, it is already an expert in escaping uh, innate immune recognition and especially also escaping uh, innate recognition of nucleic acid. And SARS-CoV-2 is really um, an expert in this. Um, you know that there's non-structural proteins. Uh, many of them have been described for uh, coronaviruses, uh, showing that uh, this is uh, this virus has established an, um, numerous mechanisms to get around immune recognition. And uh, much of this recognition, if you look at the mechanisms, uh, goes to nucleic acid directly. So messenger RNA degradation, for example, uh, two prime methyl transferase activity, uh, five prime triphosphatase and seven methyl transferase and so on. So these are effects that go directly on the uh, nucleic acid. So that already emphasizes that nucleic acid recognition is important. But the other thing, obviously, uh, non-structured proteins do is to interfere with the pathways that are uh, important. So directly with the function of proteins. So if you look at uh, this here, uh, a virus releases nucleic acid. There are certain receptors detecting nucleic acids. And then there's downstream signaling pathways. So uh, here's an example, Rig I towards Taiwan interferon induction, then interferon again comes out of the cell and uh, binds to the receptor, and the receptor has then again a signaling pathway. And all of these proteins are targeted by non-structural proteins of the virus. So targeting nucleic acid directly and the virus, uh, and this all comes together to a perfect immune escape. And compared to the other uh, coronaviruses, um, it has been found that SARS-CoV-2 is really uh, even better in escaping those immune responses. This is also emphasized uh, by uh, inborn errors of immunity that uh, are um, affecting certain components of the, of the system. So examples are uh, TOL3, then the IRFs, uh, and so on, uh, TBK1. So different signaling components of these pathways, turning down the rest of the remainder of a uh, type 1 interferon response, if you uh, will. So um, nevertheless, it seems very important that um, the virus is recognized and that there's an early type 1 interferon response. And if this is the case, the viral load is transient, goes back, and there's no serious um, uh, infection uh, developing. So how does our immune system nevertheless uh, recognize uh, SARS-CoV-2. And this is the question we were asking. And one uh, easy thing to do and very straightforward thing to do is to take the virus, uh, isolate and put it on, on blood, on human blood. This is what we did, PBMCs here, so my blood cells. And you see that SARS-CoV-2, to our surprise, is very good at inducing tamponin interferon. So it induces uh, at the level of 5 nanogram per mil interferon alpha and peripheral blood. That was very surprising because we start to get around immune recognition quite uh, effectively. Uh, while influenza does induce some uh, tamponin interferon, but not much more. Now, the, the, we were suspecting that one um, um, rare cell type, the plasmacytoid dendritic cell, is involved in this, uh, in this recognition. And if you take out this um, minor um, cell subset, the plasmacytoid dendritic cell, this type 1 interferon response uh, really disappears. Uh, you see it here. So it's about type 1 interferon um, produced by the plasma to a dendritic cell. Um, and uh, if you look at IL-6, uh, IL-6 is, of course, pro-inflammatory, and uh, SARS-CoV-2 induces this over-inflammation, but not in PBMCs and not early on. So there's almost no IL-6 influenza dust. So this is also an important uh, finding here. 
Then um, the plasma cytoid dendritic cell, just to, to illustrate, is a minor cell fraction, 0 0.2 to 0.4% of PBMCs. Um, it has tall 7 and tall 9 and nothing else uh, in terms of receptors. So tall 7 is the RNA receptor. So it all goes via tall like receptor 7 and plasma cytoid dendritic cell. And this cell is able to produce lots of type 1 interferon. Uh, on this uh, 5 nanogram per mil level in uh, PBMCs. Now, together with Fabian Hauck, uh, we looked at some rare uh, genetic disease, which is a CART11 gain of function. And uh, Fabian found that there's a complete lack of plasma cytoid dendritic cells in uh, these patients. And you, you see it here. So this window is completely um, lacking. Um, and if you take the blood of these cells, dendritic cells or PBMCs, uh, SARS-CoV-2 does not induce any type 1 interferon. So reconfirming that uh, this really is the plasma cytoid dendritic cell that is responsible for type 1 interferon induction in the peripheral blood. Now, what about monocytes? Monocytes do not contribute to SARS-CoV-2 uh, induced type 1 interferon, as you can see here, while influenza uh, does activate type 1 interferon in monocytes. Now, if we take out from PBMC, the monocytes, it doesn't change the interferon induction of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and the other thing is that in monocytes, SARS-CoV-2 does not induce IL-6 again, so no inflammatory cytokines. Nevertheless, we found that monocytes are indeed infected, so we can we, we do find uh, the SARS-CoV-2 N protein uh, in CD14 positive monocytes. So there is something going on, but not type 1 interferon induction, not interleukin-6. And if you compare it here in the Venn diagram, uh, SARS-CoV-2 leads to a down-regulation of uh, uh, dominant down-regulation of factors, while influenza does lead to a dominant up-regulation of factors. There's an intersection here, but uh, uh, it's really separate factors that are regulated. And uh, if you look here at the CAC uh, pathways, um, of influenza versus SARS-CoV-2, there is a distinct uh, picture here. So for SARS-CoV-2, for example, um, the ribosomal pathways are heavily affected. Uh, and uh, so is the, the, the setting that is, has been established for uh, coronavirus disease, COVID-19, obviously, is, uh, is found here. Uh, in monos monocytes to also separate nicely if they are activated by influenza or SARS-CoV-2. So there's uh, almost no overlap here. And uh, in, the, in the heat map analysis, uh, in green is SARS-CoV-2, in blue influenza, you see that there's a separate, uh, a different, a very distinct picture. So back to the plasma site with dendritic cell here. Um, it's well known that uh, the um, severity of the disease uh, is getting uh, worse uh, with age, obviously. So we did a clinical trial where we, uh, so we obtained clinical samples from young versus elderly people um, and compared them. So young produce much more interferon than elderly. Uh, this is no difference here for influenza. And these are just, uh, just the controls. Um, now, in uh, PBMCs, uh, here we have female versus male, so both have a decrease uh, with age of uh, interferon induction, while the PDC, if we isolate them, they do the same thing. So the PDC do not age, they are just less. So, so lower numbers of PDCs explain the lower Taiwan interferon uh, induction in the elderly. So that was like the first part. Uh, the second part is now to explain a little bit about nucleic acid immunity. And um, the important thing is here to distinguish self versus non-self nucleic acid. So molecular structure is one thing. So triphosphate at the five prime end is a molecular structure that's being recognized. Then uh, localization in certain compartments is important and the concentration uh, also regulated by, by nucleases is important. Just as a general principle, of distinguishing how, how our system distinguishes self versus non-self uh, nucleic acid. There's only a few receptors well-defined, well-known uh, by now, uh, the toll-like receptors, uh, four of them in the endolysosome, rig i like receptors, rig i and MDA5 detecting uh, nucleic acid in the, in the cytoplasm, um, RNA and DNA is recognized by CGAS and AIM2, um, where CGAS induces uh, via sting type 1 interferon. 
So uh, it's just a few receptors well defined. I can talk uh, much more about the, the details here. Just saying that the receptors have a distinct expression pattern. This is important to know. So the re I like receptors are expressed in all cell types, also epithelial cells. Um, while tau like receptors are more in immune cells, and I told you the plasma cell to dendritic cells, uh, for example, only carry tau 7 and tau 9. Now, uh, SARS CoV 2 turns down uh, Rig I uh, completely, and um, the effect by Rig I seems to be important for antiviral defense, obviously. So, um, we thought when we activate Rig I beforehand that uh, cells might be protected against uh, the invading virus. And so this is the, the principle that we uh, look at here. So some years ago, we did that with uh, influenza virus um, and uh, in a lethal version of a mouse model where all mice die within a few days. So very severe uh, infection model. And if you go uh, one day before, three days, even seven days before, uh, we completely protect uh, mice against uh, this influenza virus infection. So the system is alerted in a way that it knows there might be a virus and uh, uh, it's much better prepared. Um, now, we um, obviously we're interested whether this also would work in SARS-CoV-2. We use this um, ACE2 model, which is a very severe model, as you know, because uh, ACE2 is expressed in all cells, including brain cells, and mice uh, die rapidly um, from um, brain uh, infection. And so it's a very dramatic development. Um, so we challenge these mice, and beforehand, we inject uh, again the Rig I ligand, which activates Rig I, and then look at uh, different endpoints. The treatment by itself does really not affect uh, mice in, in that uh, dose that we used here, no weight loss. And you see that um, there's a highly significant improvement of survival uh, in these mice if we um, inject uh, and activate Rig I systemically beforehand. Uh, if you look in swaps, um, there is much less um, virus antigen uh, be, being detected here, uh, one and two two days post-infection. Um, also in the lungs, it's a, um, if you go direct in the lungs, it's a very prominent effect. So these are 3P RNA uh, treated mice and without, uh, there is much more virus in the lungs. And uh, if you go even one day after infection, uh, the effect is still quite uh, um, impressive that the virus concentration in the lungs and in the brain uh, is signif significantly down. Uh, now you can ask, well, uh, why Rig I just take in Tavon interferon might do the same thing, but it doesn't. So we uh, took a very high dose of Tavon interferon. We did a careful like dose uh, uh, analysis, and um, you see that interferon does not have this effect, and uh, Rig I activation has this uh, significant effect in, in the severe infection model. So um, that was like more like a broad spectrum antiviral um, um, induction. And now we come to the last part uh, briefly is messenger RNA vaccines. Um, so Moderna, BioNTech, uh, how do they interfere here? And uh, just, um, I think this crowd exactly knows these things. So messenger RNA is generated by uh, polymerase. Polymerase leaves the 5 prime end with a triphosphate. Our own uh, RNA is kept, a cap one structure. And exactly this cap one structure, it looks like this. So N7-methyl guanosine uh, capping and uh, methyl group at the end one position here. Uh, exactly this is important because it completely abrogates immune recognition on the one hand, and it's used for messenger RNA vaccines. So this CAP1 is put on by a co-transcriptional capping procedure, which I won't go into the detail. It's all published, but it's important to know that this is a mainstay of messenger RNA development, um, the uh, CAP1 uh, structure that gets rid of eye recognition. Um, and the second important thing that has been uh, used for messenger RNA development is TOL7, TOL8 escape. And uh, we early on in 2006 published that pseudouridine introduction in, in RNA. 
gets rid of TOL7, TOL8 recognition completely. And this was uh, then taken further by Carico in uh, translational assays to, to use messenger RNA and uh, to induce protein in vivo. And she found that pseudouridine does a great job in enhancing uh, this uh, translation of messenger RNA vaccines. So these two changes uh, that um, escape most of the immune recognition are the basis for uh, those, the, the development of those uh, important vaccines now. Uh, but is there something left? Uh, does it still contribute to the efficacy? Now, if you compare Moderna and BioNTech uh, in humans, so in a, in a small trial here, you see that both, um, if, if they are injected on the first and second day in these um, individuals, systemically induce a time interferon simulated gene score. And um, so this is the, uh, the uh, signal indicating that the 15 minutes are over. So. Okay, just, just one minute, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you take Moderna and BioNTech and PBMCs and monocyte derived macrophages, you see that uh, both activate uh, the system here. So they have a remaining uh, uh, activity. And if we purify uh, these uh, vaccines, Moderna is already purified in that way. Um, to get rid of uh, contaminating RNAs that are um, um, formed during the, the in vitro transcription process. Um, BioNTech is not. And remember that BioNTech is more stimulatory that, uh, than Moderna. Um, but here both, uh, how does it look in vivo? Both induce systemic uh, immune responses, BioNTech more than Moderna, but both do. And uh, both systemic responses are dependent on one receptor, which is MDA5. This is one of the rig like receptors. And is this important for in vivo efficacy? Uh, it is. Uh, if MDA5 is lacking, then there is no neutralizing IgG formation uh, in these mice for Moderna. The same thing for BioNTech. I uh, can show the slide uh, because of time, but it looks exactly the same. And for T cell, uh, simulations or development of T cells here, CD8 uh, T cells, I think gamma production, same thing. It's MDA5 uh, dependent, so a significant major contribution uh, of MDA5 here. So to sum this up, uh, the three parts uh, I showed you that plasmocyte dendritic cells are required uh, to de detect SARS CoV 2 uh, in the blood. Uh, we think that this is uh, very important. Um, Rig I activation provides broad antiviral protection. Um, so we can use rig eye um, activation systemically to um, protect against um, viral infection. And uh, we know, which I haven't shown, that this is due to epigenetic changes and an establishing innate immune memory um, systemically in, in these um, uh, organisms. Induction of adaptive immunity uh, by messenger RNA vaccines depends on MDA5. This is what I just showed you. Um, so CAP1 and pseudouridine for sure are the key for the development anyway, but there is a, an important contribution of nucleic acid sensing. So without nucleic acid sensing, these messenger RNA vaccines as they stand right now um, do not work in terms of adaptive immunity, so no antibodies, uh, no, no T cells. And yeah, finally, I'd like to thank uh, the highly motivated, enthusiastic uh, group here in Bonn, uh, in, at, at my institute, but also the Nucleic Acid Immunity, SFB, with the many collaborations uh, that we have established uh, between Dresden, uh, Munich, uh, Marburg, and uh, Bonn. All right, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Gunther, for this uh, very nice presentation. I think uh, the nucleic acid sensors are, uh, there's still a lot to be understood about their role in the antiviral response. I look at the chat. Um, um, there is one question already. I think we cannot afford too many questions because we're running over time already. Thomas Dorn has a question. Do you want to ask your question yourself? Uh, I, I just wondered uh, whether you have seen any changes in the PDCs uh, prior uh, vaccination and uh, then during vaccination because from some diseases we know that they disappear up in activation. Well, it's unlikely that they that they disappear. I mean, we, we have no data on this. Uh, we haven't looked, but it's unlikely because vaccination is primarily a, 
The stimulation by the messenger RNA vaccine is not a systemic one because you inject locally in the muscle. Um, and there, there are things going on, but uh, it's not that uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they would not uh, deplete PDCs on a systemic level. Uh, mm -hmm. That would be very surprising. Okay. Uh, obviously, if they are simulated, they, they disappear like all immune cells uh, from the circulation, but there's not, not a systemic PDC activation by nucleic acid. It's just not enough RNA and it, it doesn't um, reach um, the, the blood. Okay, Christian Bogdan has also a question. Christian, please. Yeah, very nice, uh, Günder. I, I'm, I'm just uh, wondering about uh, the in vivo experiment and the in vitro experiment comparing the, the two vaccines. Uh, so this was uh, sort of dose type traded because of the differential concentration after, of the mRNA um, in, in the uh, spike marks as compared to Comanati vaccine. Um, was this considered? When you compare, we're comparing the different vaccines. Yeah, so we compared the two vaccines, and uh, the there is uh, different doses used. Yeah. Um, as you know, we use the same dose uh, in in the mice um, just to compare the immune activation on on the right level because we were interested whether uh, the BioNTech, uh, which is more stimulatory in vitro, would also uh, be more stimulatory in vivo, and and it is, and. Um, then we looked at antibodies. Um, so it was not different concentrations uh, used, but the, the ones that we calculated uh, for um, Moderna. And what's the impact of the lipid nanoparticles in, in terms of inducing uh, uh, the in innate response? Because I mean, both vaccines are extremely reactogenic in, in vivo. And yeah. uh, you know, yeah. the yeah. findings you are you're showing are indicating that the TLR is, is not really playing a big role for that. And also the rig I, probably the MDA5. But uh, what about the lipid nanoparticles? So uh, MDA5 is the one in mice. Uh, we can't uh, tell about humans. It might be rig I in humans. Um, it looks a little different, but obviously it's, it's, uh, it's uh, difficult to, to study in the same way than in mice. But MDA5 is critical, required, this is what we know, but that doesn't mean that other components are not required as well. LNPs um, really drove the whole development uh, recently, so they are super required for, um, for uptake, uh, the formulation. And it has been published uh, that uh, toll-like receptor 2, I think, also um, contributes um, recognizing some components of the LNP. Yeah. Um, so, it looks like there's uh, a two-fold contribution. So without MDA5, it's not working, but uh, it might also just not work with uh, LNPs, but it's difficult to test because uh, without LNPs, the messenger yeah. RNA wouldn't get there, which uh, it's yeah. supposed to go. Yeah. 